Hi, Doctor. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Melinda. Melinda, right? <laughs> Migraine, bad migraine for one week. So, still recovering. Recovery, okay. <laughs> so, apa tu, uh, pas uh, recovery, eh? Yeah, hopefully, so I can continue and do uh, my assignment. <laughs> okay, so I thought by next week, lah, only then I have some time to review all the instruments. Okay, so this week, those who, have, uh, who, uh, who, uh, who still look for the instrument, you may proceed the instrument. Okay, I will upload the video lah. Tengok dalam satu, dua ni, dua hari ni. I will try to upload all the videos yang kita termis hari tu and then I will share with everyone. I'll try my best. Okay. Doctor, I have a question. I I don't know whether it might sound silly or not because the last, the previous week um, um, class, I I had to leave uh, towards the end. Um, did you um, share the instrument, how, how we can get the instrument in that uh, lecture? Uh, I think I did, right? Saya buat tak? Saya minta ingat saya buat ke tak? I think I did. Okay, because to be on, uh, I'll be honest, I'm having, uh, uh, I'm Trouble. struggling to do that. Yes, I'm I'm really struggling because I don't understand the whole thing at all. Mm. Um, would it be possible if you, if you have the time, like uh, maybe like a one example using the Excel because I I'm having a problem right? I mean, like ap applying it on the Excel, the whole uh, slide that you have from the instrument. I I cannot, I can't seem to apply uh, whatever that is on the thing. Okay. If you don't, mommy, if you have the time. I thought because last week uh, I've shared on how to okay. include uh, the instrument inside the Excel sheet. Okay, perhaps oh, okay. after okay. after I've upload the video and then let's see how. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought okay. Okay. those who who joined the, the, the last uh, the last time class, uh, saya rasa saya buat lah. Who who are, who was in the last time class? Arif, Arif ada tak last time punya class? Ada betul. Saya tunjuk kan? Saya tunjuk kan? Uh, ah, tak ingat. Ada. Tak ingat, tak ingat. Sorry. Oh, uh, patut apa yang ingat tu Arif. Okay, who else who was in the class last time? Apa lagi? Yang dari kelas ada tak doktor? Bagi tahu ada. Ada tak siapa-siapa? Deva, Deva ada tak? Durga? Durga ada tak dalam kelas last time? Doktor, last kelas saya ada tapi uh, sehingga pukul 5 doktor tak share because pukul 5 saya dah keluar dari kelas because I need to go back to my own house. Alamak. So, tapi okay. tak ada doktor. Aduh. 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 Okay, um, then maybe we can view the video. Tapi tak puas hati lah. Takkanlah semua orang tak ada dalam kelas last time. <laughs> Is there anybody in the class last time? Yang betul-betul ada daripada awal sampai hujung. Semua takut nak mengaku. Mengaku sampai hujung saya tak ada. <laughs> awal saja. Hey, you all ni. Siapa lagi ya ah, yang ada dalam kelas last time? Ramai. Hmm. Okay, it's okay lah kalau macam tu saya tunjuk dulu what the purpose of receipt for the next chapter kalau let's say you are unable to do this one, okay? It's okay. Tapi saya memang tak puas hati kalau siapa kata saya tak, uh, siapa yang tak ada dalam kelas last time tu. Memang sakit hati pula rasa. Okay, so it's okay. Dua oh, minggu lepas eh doktor. Minggu lepas kan tak ada kelas. Bukan minggu lepas yang hmm. the last last class yang kita ada. Saya ada short term memory loss. Ah, I'm very sorry. Tiba-tiba short term memory pula. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> apa tak apa. Ha, I'll share lah. I'll share. Okay so this is the Excel sheet. 
Okay, so this is the one that uh, that I've shared earlier. In every for every group folder now they have. So the time I thought we have uh, in my document, eh, in my folder, I have 12 uh, folders. Okay, uh, so saya tak tengok lagi siapa yang dah submit. So I'm sure some of you already submitted the draft. Okay, tapi saya tak tengok lagi. Okay, so how you can fill in this Excel sheet? It is very easy. Okay, so the first one is you need to insert your title of your research. Okay, because if you still remember, last time we learned about uh, uh, reliability and validity of the instrument. I used to remember that one. Reliability and validity of the instrument. Last time. Uh, uh, macam ada je, Doktor. Uh, ada je. Ya, yeah, saya ni membantu untuk mental, uh, apa tu mental pula, memory recovery. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> ada, ada, tapi dia penghujung sekali jadi dia macam yeah, uh, yeah, memory yeah. loss lah. uh, Session ni memang hujung last time sebab sebelum you all kita faham macam ni nak pakai ni Kena ajar konsep dulu uh, Barulah you are able to understand this one Okay, so first masukkan title dulu Okay, and then you are, kat sini ada beberapa kolom DV, okay, DV dependent variable Okay, and then yang this one untuk you all, you all tak pakai. So, bila tak pakai, delete. Jangan tinggalkan macam tu. Delete sahaja this part kalau you all tak pakai. Sebab saya, saya guna this one untuk my supervision. So, kadang-kadang saya tak adalah delete. Lepas tu nak masukkan balik, tak ada. Okay, so kalau tak pakai mana-mana kotak kat sini, delete. Okay, and then so untuk you all, you all delete this one. So, you all akan ada IV satu, independent variable satu dengan independent variable dua. Okay, and then kalau lah let's say item uh, kotak ni nanti tak cukup, jangan tanya saya, doktor kotak tak cukup. Tambahlah. Okay, tak, tak payah tak cakap dengan saya, doktor kotak ni tak cukup macam mana eh. Tambahlah kotaknya kat bawah ni, okay. Sebab, sebab apa saya cakap, memang ada student mesti saya tanya kenapa macam mana tak cukup nak buat macam mana. Okay, so then kat sini pula, kita fokus satu-satu. For example eh, the title of your study is Okay, for example, saya type kat sini Factors Contribute ah, Sorry Predictors eh, saya tukar Predictors of work uh, Of job performance lah, senang Among Employees in Manufacturing Manufacturing Companies Okay, so this is the title of my study. Okay. So then next one. So this is here, in here under the dependent variable. So I just locate my dependent variable. So what is my dependent variable in this study? What is it guys? Anybody? Based on the title. So what is my dependent variable? Hmm? Job performance. Job performance. Very good, Deva. Okay, so job performance. So basically in title, benda yang kena ada dalam title adalah yang wajib ada dan tajuk itu adalah dependent variable kita. So ini untuk quantitative. Eh? So kalau let's say you all berminat dengan qualitative nanti itu lain cerita. Ini untuk quantitative. So Excel sheet ni biasanya kita gunakan untuk quantitative research. So anybody yang interested to do qualitative, ada tak siapa-siapa yang berminat? Nak buat qualitative research. Doktor kami nak buat research pun tak pandai. Doktor ni nak pilih kualiti kuanti pula. <laughs> okay so tak apa. Hak ni saya saya ada lagi satu version untuk yang kualitatif. Tapi maksudnya you all kena faham dulu research apa yang you all nak buat. So macam mana you all nak tahu research apa yang you all nak buat. Tengok balik design yang saya tunjuk sebelum ni. Okay apa yang persoalan yang you all nak, nak tahu. Okay, contohnya kalau lah let's say you nak tahu macam mana eh, kenapa eh orang nak berhenti kerja? Uh, so the question start why people why people want to turn over? Okay, kenapa dia nak change the work? Uh, probably itu lebih kepada kuali. Tapi kalau let's say you macam nak tahu uh, apa agaknya eh faktor dalam organisasi yang menyebabkan employee ni meluat bekerja kat sini, contoh uh, itu boleh jadi kuanti. Uh, eh, dia depend uh, depend pada persoalan apa yang kita tanya. Okay, so dalam kajian ni contohnya saya nak tahu apakah faktor-faktor yang menyebabkan berlakunya yang meningkatkan uh, prestasi kerja para uh, para pekerja. Okay, so dalam tajuk ni wajib ada adalah kataan kita punya DV. 
wajib. Independent variable tu uh, saya akan present kan. Independent uh, variable tu kita guna perkataan predictors ni. Nanti kita akan dalam kita punya content kita akan describe or di discuss in detail what are those predictors. Tapi dekat tajuk kita letak je the predictors. Okay so lagi satu for your information. Ikut format UPM. Okay tajuk ni dia perkataan tajuk ni dia tak boleh lebih daripada 21 patah perkataan. Eh, 21 perkataan. Ah dia kat sini ni dia tak boleh 21 lebih daripada 21 maksimum 21 sahaja. So that's why kita cuba minimiskan the words kat here. Kalau if let's say you independent variable kalau you masukkan one by one tu dia tak melebihi 21 then should be no problem. Okay so ini untuk tajuk. Okay so conceptual definition pula. Okay dalam bab dua okay bukan dalam bab dua lain eh. bila you all start uh, doing your literature review Okay, after you you already identify your variables, your dependent variable lah especially. Okay, and then you go to the literature review. You try to determine what does it mean by job performance. Uh, tadi dulu, apa definisi, the concept of job performance. You tengok, kalau let's say ada 10 kajian berkenaan dengan job performance, then you review according to each scholars. So, what are the definition of job performance? So, dalam banyak-banyak tu, You all, you all akan jumpa satu yang you all rasa paling berkenan dengan definition given by that scholar. Okay, so konsep ni biasanya kita letakkan satu definasi of the DV yang you all rasa paling kena dengan apa yang you all nak. Okay, yang you all rasa the, the, the definition given by this author ni very impactful to you. So then you locate the conceptual definition here. Ha? Okay, so for example, eh, saya cari satu artikel yang bagi definition berkenaan dengan job performance. Sekejap, give me few moments. Eh. Okay, so saya dapat satu this one tapi dia So bila saya search from the internet, I use the keyword job performance So it leads me to this definition Okay, so job performance is a means to reach a good or set of goals within a job role or organization So this is uh, a definition but given by Campbell Okay So if let's say I am interested to use this definition as a guide, as a general definition of job performance in my study, so then I just copy this one. Okay, okay but it would be better if you if you are able to uh, to find the the main uh, apa tu the original source, which is you go directly to the Campbell 1990. Ini better lah eh. Kena cari artikel ni dan you can get the clear picture. So what does Campbell said about the job uh, job uh, job pro, uh, job performance? Okay. So ni sebenarnya author dia daripada uh, 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 Karen ni, Karen Jacobs ni, cite from Campbell. Okay. So this one I just locate in my Excel sheet. This one. So I just copy. Sorry. One, I just paste here to reach a goal or set of goal. Okay, so I locate the source here. Okay, so this is the definition and then this is the source. Okay, okay, next one now operational definition. So this one, when you choose your operational definition, this one it should be chosen after you robustly review your literature regarding the definition of job performance. Okay. Dan ini kita buat sebelah lepas you all tahu dah kriteria apa yang you, you all nak ukur berkenaan dengan job performance. Okay. So pada saya lah eh kalau you all paling senang you all cari dulu instrumen yang berkenaan dengan uh, job performance ni. Hold on eh. Saya try cari satu. Okay. Saya tunjuk. Tunjuk keyword yang saya guna Okay so saya guna dua benda Saya letak kat sini 
Okay, so biasanya kalau uh, searching engine yang saya guna adalah sama ada saya pergi yang umum ataupun yang ni. Tapi biasanya saya pergi yang ni lah. Okay, Google Scholar untuk cari the article yang related to academic. Okay, so for example saya cari, saya guna keyword job performance questionnaire. Ha, ni dah ada contoh. Okay. So dia ada this one. Contoh eh, saya buka artikel ni. Okay, so biasanya kita tengok dekat ni The measure of job performance Kita nak tahu dia nak pakai Dia pakai instrumen apa dulu Untuk measure job performance ni hmm. Ada tak disebut kat sini Dia pakai the individual work performance questionnaire ha, ni Dia pakai ni Ni nama instrumen dia eh Individual Work Performance Questionnaire by Koopman Koopman Sekejap eh, macam mana saya nak kecilkan ni Okay So dia ada tiga benda yang diukur dalam job performance ni Dia ada task performance, contextual performance and counterproductive work behaviour Ha ni So ini nama dia, so kita cuba cari item ni Okay, kita cari dulu uh, instrumen ni Ada tak dia, dia attachkan kat sini, ha ni Ha, so ini adalah instrumen yang digunakan untuk mengukur job performance. Okay. So kalau let's say, so dalam dalam ikut instrumen ni dia kata job performance ni can be measured according to tadi task performance, contextual performance and counterproductive work behaviour. Okay. So you all copy. Maksudnya dia ada tiga elemen ni. So you all copy dulu benda ni Then kita letak dekat Okay so kalau dalam kita punya Excel sheet ni Yang tiga benda tadi patut kita letak kat mana? Ha. Okay kita letak dulu dekat Kita punya operational definition Letak dulu Okay Maksudnya untuk mengukur Untuk mengukur job performance Ikut scholar tadi dia kena ada tiga elemen ni Dia kena ada elemen task performance, contextual performance and counterproductive work performance Dia wajib ada benda ni Okay so kita letak dulu this one Okay so next one adalah kita Copy satu per satu Nampak ni kan saya punya uh, instrumen ni kan Kita tak nampak Nampak, nampak, nampak. Okay. So sekarang ni kita, tugas kita adalah sebab kalau let's say you all nak pakai this instrument, kita copy satu-satu instrument ni. Ha, lagi satu you all jangan lupa dia punya source ni. Sumber dia. Sumber dia adalah, nama instrument ni adalah Individual Work Performance Questionnaire by Koopman 2015. Ha ni. Okay. Ha ni Koopman. Copy dulu source dia ni, kita letak dekat Excel sheet ni, kalau you perasan dekat sini ada source of instrument ni kan? Okay, hmm. so letak je kat sini. Ha. Ni untuk rujukan you all nanti. Okay, so you all letak. Ni dia punya sumber dia. Siapa yang nama apa nama instrument tu, nama dia adalah Individual Work Performance Questionnaire. Okay, siapa yang develop dia adalah Koopman. Koopman 2015. Okay. So sekarang kita fokus dekat item ni So give me few moments untuk copy dan paste Items dia Ini kita panggil items eh The whole set ni dia kita panggil instrument The whole set ni Okay questionnaire yang you all ada tu Borang soal sedikit yang you all ada itu Nama dia adalah questionnaire You all dah compilekan few uh, few instrument dalam questionnaire Okay You compilekan few instrument untuk mengukur keseluruhan variable Kita panggil questionnaire Tapi this one ni Satu set of items ni Kita panggil instrument yang mengukur Ataupun tools yang mengukur uh, uh, Job performance variable Okay Satu-satu ayat dalam ini kita panggil items Items Okay item 1, item 2, item 3 and so on Okay So, bagi give me a few moment untuk copy dan paste semua ni, okay? Okay. 
Sebab kalau tak tunjukkan tak tahu pula. Kopi satu-satu ni. Satu, dua, tiga, empat, lima. It's raining outside. Pak mm. Umar saya petang-petang je hujan sekarang. It's also raining, Doctor. I'm yeah. free. Good, kan? Petang-petang ni rasa macam Ya Allah sedangnya tidur. Ha, ha, ha. I wish. Nah, tak apalah, we sacrifice a little bit for our future, mana tahu kan? Hmm, kalau rasa got kids at home so cannot sleep also in the afternoon. Got class or no class? <laughs> Baik, ha. setengah yang ada kids tu, tak apalah, enjoy lah. Bila kids dah besar nanti, rindu pula. Betul, betul. Eh, lagi few few items. Doctor, I think I need to change my template. Why? Because uh, I did, but uh, I think I not follow the rules. It's okay. Nanti ada ada masa lagi. Boleh betulkan. Thanks, Doctor. Uh, boleh betulkan. So, doctor, for this is uh, we just pick one article which we find most uh, relevant, right? Uh, not one article. Ini kebetulan sebab saya dah biasa benda ni. Untuk you all, oh. <laughs> untuk you all, you all kena study betul-betul dulu. The definition yang you think best suit your own interest. Okay. Macam saya, sebab saya dah biasa dengan the instrument, that's why saya cari tu laju. Okay, so okay. untuk you all, you all kena tengok dulu. Okay, the definition of uh, your uh, your rivals and then you tengok hmm. mana yang you all rasa kena dengan apa yang you all nak. Sebab kadang-kadang bila kita nak buat research ni, dalam kepala kita, kita dah ada gambaran yang rival ni macam mana kita nak ukur. Kita dah hmm. ada dah hmm. kan, dia elemen tu. Hmm. Uh, so, you all kena hmm. control, ni tak semestinya satu lah, mungkin banyak. Okay, okay so, so same, kita... applies, same applies with the items as well. We can source from different articles, right? 
Okay, so you means that you want to combine few article, few instrument in one construct. Uh, sorry, you want to come meaning? Um, what I'm talking, uh, but mainly I think uh, what I want to um, ask is for the items because uh, they, I mean, different articles, they might have different, different questions, right? Okay. So be careful in that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you choose the instrument, eh, I strongly not recommend you to combine items from different instrument. Okay. okay. Uh, eh? Sebab dia okay. macam ni tau. Okay, so bila setiap seorang scholar dia develop this instrument, dia tak develop dalam masa sehari ataupun dua hari. Okay, dia bila mm -hmm. dia develop ni, dia ada few testing, few stages yang dia buat dan biasanya makan tahun. Okay, mm -hmm. so bila dia dah come out dengan that instrument in which that instrument is specifically to measure these three component for example. So kalau kita okay. combine, dia mungkin tak tally. Okay. Ah, okay. Dia sama macam kalau kita ada macam ruler kita tu. Okay, ruler. Ruler kita ni kita gunakan untuk mengukur uh, uh, apa tu, unit biasa, unit dalam sentimeter biasa. Tapi tiba-tiba kalau let's say, kita ni tengah buat bangunan, is it okay kalau kita guna that ruler tu? Ah, dia mungkin tak kena dengan specific uh, apa tu, keadaan yang kita nak guna. Okay, so my recommendation, okay. kalau you all dapat satu instrument ni, You all jangan ubah instrumen ni. Kita boleh ubah ayat tapi jangan combine. Okay. Ha, kecuali konstruk yang you all gunakan ni memang tak ada dalam this one dan you all nak tambah. Itu boleh. Ha, okay. Itu kalau you all dekat bila you all dah biasa dengan this stage should be no problem. Tapi untuk as a novice researcher, okay, kita faham the basic concept dulu. Eh? Okay. Alright. Okay. okay. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, um, so now kita dah masukkan. So ada 18 item kat sini. Okay, so now kita tengok balik article tadi. Okay, sebab kalau you operasan eh, kat sini oh, lemak. Kalau you operasan, dekat column ni saya ada letakkan sub construct, source of items, item direction, reliability and remarks. Remarks ni sebenarnya option lah kalau you all nak tanda apa-apa ataupun nanti saya akan bagi komen kat sini. Okay, so sub-construct ni, dia merujuk kepada is there any sub-construct of this construct? Faham tak? So tadi kalau kita perasan, dia kata untuk mengukur based on Kuhlman ni, Kuhlman ni dia kata untuk mengukur job performance, dia mesti ada tiga ni. Task performance, contextual performance and counterproductive work behavior. So boleh jadi inilah dia sub-construct dia. So items ni kita kena identify which items that belongs to task performance, which items refer to contextual performance and then which items referring to counterproductive work behavior. Okay, dia tak semua, tak semua instrumen dia macam ni. Dia depends pada instrumen tersebut. Ada instrumen yang dia tak ada pun sub construct ni. Okay, kalau tak ada then you all tak payah isi kat sini. Kalau ada then try to identify. Okay. Okay. Faham, eh? So kita tengok dekat artikel. So is there any information regarding the sub, uh, this sub construct stated inside this instrument? Kita try tengok. Ha, ni nampak ni. Ujung ni dia dah buat ni. Yang hitam ni, tree ni belongs to task of uh, yang task. lima ni. Ha, task performance. Another 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Another 8 items referring to uh, apa kau ni counterproductive apa ada di satu lagi satu task performance contextual performance and lastly counterproductive work performance ha hmm. kita letak ni okey so go kita pergi balik lap, uh, 58 585 okey kita pergi balik dekat excel sheet ni kemudian dia kata kat sini lima item pertama merujuk kepada task performance And lapan item seterusnya merujuk kepada, kepada konteks Okay, last one Yang lima terakhir Merujuk okay. kepada counterproductive Salah kolam So sekarang ni dia akan tally lah. Kita punya operational definition ada benda ni task performance, 
context tu dia ada kat sini ada tas ada konteks dan ada counterproductive work behavior. So, daripada sinilah you all boleh constructkan you all punya definition of term. So, you all boleh kata in this study top performance is defined is operationalized as task performance, contextual performance and counterproductive work behavior. That's it. Itu you all punya definition of uh, operational definition untuk job performance dalam kajian you all. Kenapa kita kena ada this definition of term? Sebab mungkin ada kajian lain dia buat pasal job performance tapi dia gunakan uh, sub, dia gunakan elemen yang berbeza untuk mengukur job performance. So boleh jadi findings dia tak sama dengan findings kita. Faham? Dia boleh jadi contohnya kalau saya, saya nak tahu kesan Uh, personality terhadap prestasi kerja. Mungkin dalam kajian saya, saya jumpa uh, saya kata ada ada hubungan yang positif tapi mungkin kajian orang lain dia kata ada hubungan negatif dan ada juga kajian lain kata hubungan tu tak ada, tak ada hubungan. So bila kita nak bila kita nak consider kenapa ada perbezaan hubungan, hubungan ni kita, kita boleh rujuk kepada elemen yang dimasukkan dalam pengukuran tersebut. Dalam nak mengukur job performance tu apa yang dimasukkan dalam kesemua research yang ada finding yang berbeza ni. So basis perbezaan dia adalah di sini. Apa yang kita masukkan untuk kita ukur tu. Okay. Faham eh? So kat sini memang kita ada elemen task, task performance. Okay. Kita ada contextual performance. And lastly kita ada counterproductive work behaviour. Tak masalah. Clear eh? So ni tally, yang ni tally dengan this one. Okay, so operational definition ni dia sangat penting sebab dia akan menunjukkan betul ke tak instrumen yang kita pakai ni. Inilah step yang kita gunakan untuk menentukan content validity. Kalau you all boleh recall last time saya mengajar mengenai uh, validity dengan reliability inilah kaedah untuk kita menentukan sama ada instrumen kita valid ataupun tak. Valid ataupun tak ni kita nak make, nak make sure yang instrumen ni tally dengan kita punya operational definition. Tally tu macam mana? Kalau saya sebut ada task performance kat sini dia mesti ada task performance kat dalam item, kat dalam instrumen. Kalau saya kata kat sini ada contextual dia mesti ada contextual item kat sini. Okay, ha, so kat sini sekarang dia ada tally. Tally maksudnya dalam kes sekarang dia adalah instrumen yang valid. Faham? Okay, next one source of item. Source of item ni kalau let's say dalam kes yang Melinda bagi contoh tadi kalau you all combine a few instrumen dalam untuk mengukur sesuatu variable dan you all letaklah source dia kat sini. Source. Eh, kalau let's say you all ada sumber yang berbeza. Tapi dalam kes ni sumber kita sama. Cookman. Dia guna kita guna instrumen yang sama. So tak, so you all boleh abaikan this part. Okay. Next one adalah items direction. So items direction ni kita kena identify satu-satu. Macam mana nak identify? Okay. So first sekali dia depend pada nature of variable tu. So saya nak tanya job performance ni secara uh, logiknya dia adalah positive behavior ataupun negative? Positive. Positif. Okay. So kita letak kat sini positif behaviour. Saya nak tanya lagi satu contoh. Kalau lah variable kita adalah misconduct. For example misconduct contoh dia adalah absent. Dia dia positif ke negatif behaviour? Negatif. Negatif. Very good. So dalam item kita ni kalau let's say kita punya uh, Variable ni lecture dia adalah positif Kita kena tengok atau kita kena make sure yang item kebanyakan item kita ni positif Okay, kalau dia negatif tak apa tapi kita take note which item yang negatif Faham? Okay so kalau okay. kalau overall variable kita negatif Dan kita kena make sure later on item kita semua dalam negatif Okay Okay so saya bagi contoh I manage to plan my work so that I finish it on time. Positif ke negatif? Positif. Very good. Okay, positif lah sebab dia menyokong good performance. 
Okay, so next one, I kept in uh, in mind the work result I needed to achieve. Positive. Positive, positive. good. I was positive. able to set priorities. Positive. positive. I was able to carry out my work if, if efficiently. Positive. Okay. I make I manage my time well. Positive. Okay. On, on my own initiative, I started new tasks when my old tasks were completed. Positive. Positive. Okay. I took on challenging tasks when they were available. Positive. Positive. Oh, positive. I work on keeping my work skills up to date. Positive. Okay, I came up with creative solution for new problems. Positive. Okay. Uh, I took on extra responsibilities. Positive. Positive. I continually sought new challenges in my work. Negative. I continually sought new challenges in my work. Positive. Positive. Okay. Oh, <laughs> sorry, sir. Sorry. Okay, so I actively participated in meetings and all consultations. Positive. Positive. I complete about minor work related issues at work. That's negative. Yes, this one is negative. So, but by nature, counterproductive, yes, referring to negative behavior, right? Counter work productive behavior, counterproductive behavior. So, it is negative. Okay. Okay, and then I make problems at work bigger than they were. Negative. 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 Okay. So, uh, next one, uh, I focus on the negative aspects of situation at work instead of the positive aspects. Negative. 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 I talk to clicks about a negative aspects of my work. Negative. Negative. I talk to people outside the organization about the negative aspects of my work. Negative. Negative. Ah, so, identify dulu benda ni. Ini, ini nanti dia akan berkait dengan data analysis. Ini dulu yang you all kena identify. So now you are able to determine which items negative and then which items are uh, positive direction. Okay, faham eh this one eh? Faham, faham doktor. Faham, faham doktor. Yeah, good. So next one adalah reliability. Reliability ni, bila kita belajar last time, ada few methods to determine the reliability. Salah satunya adalah dengan menggunakan kaedah Cronbach Alpha which is this procedure ni referring to the internal consistency, kesahan dalaman. Okay, so but dalam this one, nanti kita, untuk kajian kita nanti, kita akan dapatkan item reliability ni lepas kita buat pilot study. Okay, bila kita buat pilot study, nanti kita akan dapatlah Cronbach Alpha. Tetapi, sebelum kita buat pilot study ni, bila kita nak menentukan kualiti instrumen yang kita pilih ni, kita letak dulu reliability values ni according to past studies that also use this instrument. Faham? Sebab kita sekarang ni kita nak make sure item yang kita ambil ni, instrumen yang kita ambil ni is a good quality, is a good one. Okay? So inilah kriteria yang kita kena consider. So kita letakkan reliability value dia. Mana kita nak dapat? Okay, kita pergi balik dekat artikel tadi. Biasanya dalam setiap artikel dia akan nyatakan nilai Cronbach Alpha ni. So you all kena pandai cari saja. So kalau kat sini dia guna perkataan loadings ni. Loadings ni. Ni. Okay. Ada kadang-kadang dia guna perkataan Cronbach Alpha. Ada kadang-kadang dia guna perkataan loading. Faktor, factor loading. Okay. Dia, dia merujuk kepada benda yang sama. Okay, mungkin sistem dia pakai ni, yang ni bila nak analisis ni, dia advanced system. Ha, betul lah. Dia pakai uh, uh, structural equation modeling. Advanced punya. So, bila, untuk statistical advanced, yang advanced punya dia pakai terms loading. Kalau uh, dalam artikel tu data analisis dia pakai SPSS, biasanya kita guna perkataan Cronbach Alpha. Tapi apa pun dia merujuk kepada benda yang sama iaitu reliability. Ataupun consistency of the instrument. So apa yang kita boleh buat? Kita just copy je uh, ni. Uh, values ni dalam kita punya Excel sheet tadi. 
So give me few moments untuk saya copy dan paste eh. Habis saya berapa minit untuk saya copy dan paste. Supaya you all lagi nampak. So this is the end result. Okay, so kita dah dapat dah. Okay, so kalau ikutkan kat sini, value dia, value reliability ni uh, dia tak tetap. Okay, dia ada rendah dan dia ada yang tinggi. Okay, so kalau you all buka balik lecture note saya, dia ada certain values yang kita consider uh, reliability ni bagus. Okay, in which 0.7 and above. 0.7 and above ni kita uh, mean consider to be a good items lah. So kalau dalam ni kita tengok ada beberapa items yang rendah. This one contohnya. Okay, ini saya tanda kamera. This one. Yang bawah daripada tujuh. Okay, you all tengok saya punya lecture note. This one. Okay. okay. So dalam case ni, okay. Saya tak cadangkan you all delete lagi lah items ni. You all just proceed with your pilot study. Tapi kita tengok nanti. Kita run balik dan kita tengok balik value ni. Tapi for the time being, ini sahaja. Untuk the first construct bagi job performance ni. Okay, faham eh untuk this one? Okay, so next one contohnya. Ini tak ada. Okay, contohnya uh, I choose my tak ada kat sini. Okay. Independent variable to be Uh, apa ah hmm. career deve uh, performance career development opportunity contohnya okay. so ini saya punya IV IV yang pertama so apa yang saya akan buat first saya akan cari dulu artikel yang bagi saya definition of career development opportunity dan akan cari, uh, saya akan uh, construct the operational definition and then cari items. Okay, so first saya akan cari dulu eh. Sekejap mana. Career development. Instrument. Doktor? Yes, yes. Macam mana? Dependent. Uh, satu variable, satu artikel. Uh, macam tu ke doktor? Dia bukan uh, satu variable, satu artikel. Uh, oh, maksudnya item ke konstruk ke apa? Instrument? Ah, uh, Instrument. Uh, Sebab ada artikel itu kita dah guna untuk job performance. Uh, betul. So, we have... Bila nak cari pun kena cari yang lain. Okay? Oh. Ah, so each, uh, so each variable dia kena ada kos, uh, dia kena ada instrumen dia sendiri. Okay, dia All tak right. boleh hanya satu instrumen sahaja. Good, good. Okay. 
tengok item uh, ni artikel ni ada ke tak Yang ni tak sama macam yang saya nak. Okey. Tak sama. Cari lagi. Uh, doktor, one more question. Kalau kita nak cari artikel, kita kena cari macam ni ke? Career Development Opportunity Instrument. Yes. Ha, eh, oh, kena letak instrumen Yelah, kalau tak macam mana kita nak jumpa benda yang betul So kita kena spesifikkan apa yang kita nak Okay, keyword okay, tu betul sangat betul. penting Okay, keyword tu yang akan uh, akan menentukan sama ada kita jumpa ke tak instrumen yang kita nak Okay, okay. that's good Ya yeah. Macam ni, jumpa ke tak ni The instrument developed for the present was based on Dia ni develop instrument ni Tapi dia tak nyatakan instrument dia hmm. Dia develop instrument tapi dia tak nyatakan instrument dia kat sini Perceived development opportunity fairness Ah ni Dia ada sembilan item Oh, dia ada item dia kat sini. Hmm. Tapi dia bukan dia tak letak dalam table so susah. Perceived development opportunity. Fairness. Sekejap eh saya cari. So dia pakai ni lah ni nama item, uh, instrumen yang dia pakai. Perceived development opportunity fairness yang dia pakai. Saya cuba tengok. Ni. Tapi dia pakai this one lah ni Dah mana dah tadi These nine items can be seen as having to highly correlated dimension Participating in carrying So this, these are also one of the instrument um, yeah. The items right? Yeah. This is one of the items uh, so One of the nine items Two, two of the nine items right? Eight items Yeah. yeah. Dia ada eight Sekejap eh tak ada, dia tak nyatakan. So kalau tak nyatakan macam ni, ada dua cara je. Sama ada you contact the original author untuk dapatkan instrumen dia ni. Ni. Contact this one, email them to get the instrument. Kalau let's say you all tak ada cara lain dah nak juga instrumen ni, then you contact the the author. Kalau let's say susah sangat, then try find another instrument. Ha, itu cara dia. Eh, saya cakap ini. Hmm. Area development opportunity instrument. This one, cuba tengok. Kita cuba cari yang ada. Nah, ni dia pakai tengok eh, dia pakai ni ha. Ni pun dia minta, kena minta kebenaran. Perceived carrier barriers was developed to identify yang dia pakai ni. Sekejap. Biasanya dia akan attach tapi dia tak attach kat sini. Exploratory factor analysis Tak ada aku letak, letak kat sini tak apa cari lain Ok 
career development approach career development instrument Okay, instrumen ni yang rainy sikit ni. Saya tukarlah eh. Saya tukar. Saya ambil work life balance. Susah nak cari. Semua design to measure work life balance. Contoh this one tu tengok. Dia ada tapi kena spend some time untuk cari instrumen ni. Dia pun dia tak senyatakan eh. Ini, ha, ni ada work life balance Okay, so dia ada dua lain Work life uh, sama ada work to life Ataupun uh, life to work Okay, so dia ada dua section lah ni Okay Okay, so ni item dia ni Okay, so track kita tengok kan Saya tukar, saya tukar balik ni Design to measure work life balance So saya punya variable tadi saya tukar kepada Work life balance Ni work life Okay Kita tengok dekat artikel ni Okay so these are the Items used in the uh, These are the items Used to measure the work life balance So saya, dah, saya copy eh this one Dia ada sepuluh item kot. Personal life suffers, job mix, personal life difficult. Okay, neglect personal needs, of work. Put personal life on put for work. Next personal activities. Okay, struggle to juggle for work and non-work. Um, so, doctor, basically, it would be the same uh, earlier as the DB, right? It's yeah. the same procedure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I get it. So, um, I don't. I feel so bad taking up so much of your time. It's okay, it's okay. But as long as everybody got clear idea on how to do the, how to fill in the Excel sheet. Ini sebenarnya part yang paling critical bila buat bila buat research. Okay, select the right so, instrument. Mm -hmm. Paling penting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for the um, IV is uh, whatever that we we uh, we pick. Yes. Whatever that we find best suited, right? Okay. Betul. Whatever that you think. Um, sekejap eh. Mana dah saya ni? Uh, personal life. Give me energy for my work. Okay. Uh, mana any variable that you think that you you think you want to explore within your study. Okay. So the, the IP is a variable tu. You need to decide by yourself lah. After reviewing your, your literature. And then if let's say you have your own idea what are the variables that you want to focus on and it is your choice, your own choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Focusing on the main um, uh, DV that uh, yes. I want to explore, right? Okay, 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 I understand. I think this really clears up like 90%, 95%, 99% of everything. Very good lah. 
So saya dah tak payah ajar lah lepas ni. Okay, so ni boleh eh? Boleh. <laughs> so, sekejap. So ini dia punya end result. So this ada item. Sama, sama sahaja proses tadi. So this one you need to identify. Uh, conceptual definition, operational definition and then source of instrument. So this one item ni dia macam, yang ni dia macam tricky sikit. Okay sebab macam mm -hmm. contoh personal life suffers because of work. So ini adalah item yang mengukur work to life conflict kan. Betul? Mm -hmm. Work life. This one ni balance ke tak? This item ni negative ke positif? Negative. 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 Yes, so negative. Uh, it's tricky sikit this one. Job makes personal life difficult, also work to life. Okay. So ni neglect personal needs because of work, negative, uh, work to life, put personal life on hold for work, uh, work to life, miss personal activities because of work, work to life, struggle to juggle work and non-work, work life, happy with the amount of time for non-work activities. Okay. Balance. This one work to life but the item is positive. Oh. Uh, right? The balance lah hmm. maksudnya. This one. Okay. So the, the rest are negative item. Kalau yang ni pula personal life drains me energy to work. Dia negative item. Okay. The, it is an, a negative item. Betul kan? Negative item. Hmm. Tapi ni yes. ada life to work conflict. Okay. Maksudnya, uh, apa tu, matters or uh, personal matters interact with work life. Uh, ah, okay. this one. Okay, so then uh, ni pun sama life to work. Life to work. Okay. Hard to work because of personal matters. Personal life give me energy. Okay, so yang ni, dia stop kat sini. Ni negative. Tapi sampai kat sini, personal life give me energy for my work. Okay, life to work tapi dia adalah positif, balance. Okay and then job give me energy to pursue personal activities, balance, positif. Better mood at work because of personal life, balance. Better mood hmm. because of job, balance. Ha, eh. ha, so ini maksudnya faham eh? Uh, make sure the rest pun faham macam mana Melinda faham. Is there any question from the floor regarding the items on how you are going to prepare this one? Sebab lepas ni saya tak nak ajar dah. Dah tak sempat dah. Guys, semua faham eh? Berkenaan macam mana nak buat ni. So bila untuk kita construct ni, make sure untuk setiap variable you all mesti ada instrumen dia sendiri. Okay, tak boleh you all kata nak measure job performance. Tapi dalam construct you all, dalam question you all, you all hanya ada Instrumen mengukur IV, tak boleh. Dia kena ada semua untuk setiap rival. Okay? Faham eh? So kalau let's say dalam tajuk ni, saya letak saya punya IV adalah work life balance dan lagi satu probably uh, personality, uh, sorry. This one saya nak letak organizational citizenship behavior. Contoh lah eh. Contoh. So kalau ni let's say macam tadi saya kata tajuk saya saya letak predictors. Kan sekarang ni sebab saya ada dua IV so saya nak tukar. Saya nak tukar ni saya nak letakkan kedua-dua nama IV saya dalam tajuk ni. Ha, so pun boleh. So tajuk saya adalah uh, influence of work life balance and Uh, organizational citizenship behavior towards job performance. Uh, oh, uh, doktor, okay. lepas kita dah tentukan kita punya IV, so kita tukar title kita boleh? Macam ni? Nak, nak Macam tukar boleh, tak nak tukar pun tak apa. Nak okay. tukar boleh, tak nak tukar pun tak apa. Tapi bila you all kita tukar, tukar, bila you all tukar, So you all kena kira balik perkataan ni make sure tak lebih daripada 21. Satu. Okay so kita kira. Satu, hmm. dua, tiga. Tiga ni satu perkataan. 
4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Ha, so kalau 16 boleh maintain. Okay. Okay. Faham semua? Okay, dah tahu. Okay. Faham, faham. Okay, is there any more question related to this one? No, doctor. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Okay, so baru kita nak masuk topik kita hari ini. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you, Doctor. One hour. Purpose of, just thank you. Yeah, what the purpose of proceed further if you still unable to uh, to do it practically, right? So, tak apa. Itu lagi penting, you all boleh buat. Okay, so this this week topic. Thank you, Doctor. I'm to focus on. Sekejap eh. Ada siapa-siapa yang mesej saya yang tak bereply tu, I'm truly sorry. Saya memang, uh, I feel I, I, I'm having a screen fatigue these few weeks. Yes, tell me about it. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm having trouble. Memang untuk reply message tu uh, susah sangat. Email saya lagi suka dengan email. <laughs> okay. So this is kita punya topik hari ni eh. Population and sampling. Okay. So this is our LO at the end of the session, students are able to identify population, okay, determine principle and objective of sampling, okay, determine different types of sampling and determining sample size. So kat sini sebenarnya ada beberapa benda lah yang saya nak tekankan, okay. Paling penting ni kat sini ni, yang hujung ni, determining sample size. Okay, so population. So population, what is population? What is population? A group of people. A group of people that share similar characteristic. Okay, satu kumpulan yang ada share satu karakteristik yang sama. Ikut pada sudut yang kita nak. Contohnya kalau kita kata kita nak study, kita nak study rakyat Malaysia. So populasi dia adalah keseluruhan rakyat Malaysia termasuklah di Semenanjung Malaysia dan Sabah dan Sarawak. Kalau kajian kita, kita nak fokus kepada masyarakat India So populasi kita adalah masyarakat India hmm. Kalau kita nak study uh, guru di sekolah rendah Dan uh, kita punya populasi adalah kesemua guru di yang mengajar di sekolah rendah Itu nama populasi, dia depend kepada fokus yang kita nak Fokus kajian kita Okay So it is a group which is a sample is drawn Uh, so populasi ni dia juga merujuk kepada uh, kumpulan individu di mana sampel tu diambil Sampel ni maksudnya dalam sepat dalam satu kumpulan tu kita ambil few uh, few numbers sahaja Kita tak ambil keseluruhan eh? Okay so study study that involve the whole population is known as census Kajian eh kajian kalau let's say kita buat satu kajian tu Kita buat kajian tu dengan uh, dengan uh, apa tu dengan merangkumi kesemua populasi. So nama kajian ni adalah census. Dia ada nama hmm. spesifik dia eh. So macam contoh banci. eh. Ah contoh banci tu. My census. Ha. So banci tu adalah satu contoh kajian census. Okay. Kebanyakan kajian kuantitatif ni dia melibatkan sampling. Ha. So bila melibatkan sampling ni dia ada nama 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 sampel uh, sampel nantilah yang kita akan belajar. Okay, so census ni biasanya kita akan guna kalau kajian tu memang memerlukan uh, semua semua populasi, semua ahli dalam populasi tu menjawab kajian tu. Ataupun contohnya you all menjalankan kajian di satu organisasi yang organisasi tu hanya ada contohnya uh, employee dia adalah 100 orang. Uh, so then you nak include ke semua uh, uh, employee within the organisation so nama dia adalah census kajian tu. Okay, faham eh? Okay, tetapi ini kelemahan sensus lah eh. Kalau sensus tu melibatkan keseluruhan populasi dan populasi dia adalah melibatkan ramai so dia akan jadi costly. Costly ni dari daripada segi time, money and effort. So sama macam sensus lah macam dalam banci tu. Okay, dia memang time consuming. Dia memerlukan 5, 6, 7, 8 bulan untuk kita completekan that study. Okay, uh, and then Why do we need to include everybody when a group of members can represent the whole population? Ha, ini dia punya argument lah. Bila kita kata kalau let's say, okay, kita collect data daripada keseluruhan populasi. Sedangkan sebenarnya 
bila kita pilih sampel sahaja dia sebenarnya sampel ni pun dah boleh represent our population. So why do we need to conduct this, uh, apa tu? Why we need to collect the information from every member in the population? Uh, so ini dia punya idea lah. Kenapa kita nak kita perlu collect kalau let's say kita punya sampel uh, populasi kita tadi adalah guru yang mengajar di sekolah menengah contohnya. How many teachers are there in Malaysia? Berapa agak-agak? Seluruh Malaysia. Semenanjung dengan Sabah dengan Sarawak. Berapa agak-agak? Hmm? Ada siapa-siapa cikgu kat sini? Berapa agak-agak? 3.5 million. Uh, around 3.5 million teachers. If let's say you... Oh. you ha, contoh lah eh. 3.5 uh, apa tu juta. So how may, how long you think that you will complete your study if you include all teachers in your study? Berapa lama agak-agak? Kalau let's say you all seorang je buat data collection tu. Kalau banci tu sebab dia ada upah banyak RA beratus-ratus, beribu. Setiap, setiap negeri, setiap daerah tu dia ada research assistant. Tapi kalau kita sebagai researcher ni, kita ni dengan kos yang kita ada, dengan tenaga yang kita ada, agak-agak berapa lama baru kita boleh completekan kajian kita ni. Ha. Baru collect uh, apa tu 2000, dah ada grup baru dah yang masuk, dah, dah ada cikgu baru yang masuk ke sekolah tu. Bila agak-agak akan habis data collection kita. Okay, so the argument is, so why do we need to include everybody in the group when a group of members can represent the whole population. So inilah the idea why we need the sample. Why we need sample instead of population. Okay, tapi kita kena still tahulah siapa populasi kita. Okay, so bila kita nak memilih sample kita ni daripada populasi, okay, ni okey ni ni perbezaan dulu dah eh perbezaan dulu daripada segi sampling dalam kualitatif sorry bila kita nak memilih sampel dalam populasi ni nama dia adalah proses dia adalah sampling proses per sampelan okey so ini adalah perbezaan the differences in sampling in quantitative and qualitative research dia ada beza persampelan dalam kualitatif dengan kuantitatif kalau dalam kuantitatif Dia adalah based on unbiased and represent the population. Prinsip dia. Bila kita pilih sample, eh, bila kita conduct quantitative research, when we want to select our sample, we need to make sure that the selection of sample must be unbiased. Okay, dia tak, kita tak boleh simply pilih. Dia mesti ada kriteria yang kita tentukan untuk memilih. Okay, and then sample yang kita pilih tu mestilah representative the population. They must represent the population. Okay. Meanwhile, kalau untuk kualitatif ni, kita pilih sample dia kita berdasarkan ease in assessing the potential respondents and then your judgment that the person has extensive knowledge related to study phenomenon. Okay. So, kalau dalam kualitatif, kita pilih sample ni, dia berdasarkan mana yang kita rasa senang dengan kita. Okay. Okay. And then kita pilih ni berdasar, kita pilih responden kita ni berdasarkan kita punya penilaian bahawa orang yang kita nak pilih ni dia mempunyai ilmu, knowledge, skill berkenaan dengan kajian kita. Faham? Contoh, okay, contoh kalau saya nak buat kajian kualitatif, saya nak mengkaji mengenai leadership. Saya nak kaji mengenai leadership. Okay. So dan saya nak kaji leadership ni adalah um, yang uh, uh, leadership dalam organisasi. So mungkin saya akan start dengan leaders dekat jabatan saya dulu. Saya akan kaji mungkin manager saya dulu. Orang yang dekat dengan saya, orang yang saya tahu dia ada pengalaman mengenai leadership. Uh, itu maksud dalam kualitatif. Maksudnya kita uh, purposely choose that person because we believe that person is able to give the answer that uh, that what we want. Okay, itu untuk kualitatif. Tapi kalau dalam kuantitatif ni tak boleh macam tu. Dia mesti ada kriteria. Okay, inilah nanti kita akan belajar mengenai random sampling. Okay, untuk yang kuantitatif. Dalam kualitatif ni dia more kepada convenient lah. Convenient. Okay, ataupun nama dia purposive sampling. Purposive. Okay, 
So the purpose of sampling in quantitative research, kita, we want to draw inferences about the group from which you have selected the sample. So tujuan persampelan dalam quantitative adalah daripada sample ni kita nak buat inference. We want to infer our finding from the sample ni to the population. Inference, generalization. Okay, meanwhile for qualitative research, Okay, the purpose of uh, uh, the purpose of sampling is to gain an in-depth knowledge about a situation, event, episode, or to know as much as possible about different aspects of an individual on the assumption that individual is typical of the group and hence will provide insights into the group. Uh, so, kalau dalam kuali ni, kita buat uh, kita uh, kita cari pilih sampel ni sebab apa sebab kita bukan nak buat inference tapi kita nak faham the phenomenon tu according to that individual experience okey kita nak faham sesuatu fenomena ni berdasarkan experience pengalaman individu tu okey and then in terms of sample size kalau dalam quantitative okey The sample size uh, sample size ni guided by a predetermined sample size. Maksudnya sebelum kita buat uh, kita buat data collection, kita kena tentukan dulu sample size yang kita nak dalam kajian kita. Okay, in which dalam kualiti, quantitative ni, the large sample size is always the better. Uh, ini a basic principle dalam quantitative lah. Okay, semakin besar sample size tu, semakin bagus, semakin dia dekat dengan populasi. Semakin dekat dengan populasi, semakin close our finding to the population. Okay, tetapi kalau dalam qualitative research, the number of sample ni dia depends on point of data saturation. Kalau dalam qualitative, bilangan responden yang akan terlibat dalam kajian kita ni dia bergantung kepada data saturation. So what is data saturation? Data saturation apa dia? Maksud saturation apa eh? Tepu. Dalam bahasa Melayu dia adalah tepu. Saturate. Tepu. Okay, so bilangan sampel dalam kualiti ini dia bergantung kepada ketepuan data. Ketepuan data ni dia berlaku apabila Okay, for example, bila kita conduct interview. Okay, when we conduct the interview session with our interviewee. Okay, so first, first contohnya saya interview Melinda. Okay, saya interview Melinda berkenaan dengan Malaysian, uh, apa tu, Malaysian favorite food contohnya. Okay, so saya interview Melinda dan Melinda bagi saya lima jenis makanan yang digemari oleh dia. Nasi lemak, nasi kerabu, uh, <laughs> capati, uh, roti canai, lagi apa lah, lagi satu, uh, laksa pinang contohnya, lima. Okay, and then I proceed to my next interview with Deva. Okay, Deva juga bagi, uh, Deva bagi empat, tapi another example ni yang, uh, yang laksa pinang ni tak bagi, dia bagi capati. Yang nombor enam ni dia bagi capati. So in my data, I found one new finding. Based on Melinda tadi, saya dah dapat lima. Tapi dengan Deva tadi, dia berjawab empat sama dengan Melinda tapi dia ada one new finding which is capati. Okay, so I still got one new finding. Then I proceed with the third finding, with the third interview. I interview Syarul Zakwan contohnya. Okay, dan lepas uh, interview Syarul Zakuan, dia kata uh, uh, dia punya makanan sama. Sama dengan apa yang diberi oleh Melinda dengan apa yang diberi oleh Deva. Sama. Okay, dan I interview lagi satu. I interview Durga. Durga pun bagi jawapan yang sama. Dia dah repeat dah. Jawapan yang diberi oleh Melinda, jawapan yang diberi oleh Deva dan jawapan yang diberi oleh Zakuan. So this thing we call it as data saturation. Maksudnya apabila jawapan yang diberi oleh responden itu sama dengan jawapan yang diberikan oleh responden yang sebelumnya, it means that 
the data already reached the saturated point. Faham? Uh, maksudnya bila-bila kita interview responden tak kira responden ketiga ke keempat ke kelima Contohnya responden kelima, so jawapan yang responden kelima bagi ni dia repeat, dia dah sama dengan jawapan responden pertama, kedua, ketiga dan keempat so means that our data already reached the saturated point. Ha, so maksudnya dalam kajian kualitatif tadi hanya lima responden. Faham? Faham apa maksud data saturation? You all kena faham betul-betul this one. Apa maksud data saturation ni? Faham? Ah, tak faham dah recording nanti. Faham, Kapitan. Okay. <laughs> dah semua diam tu faham dah tu. Okay. Next one is sampling procedure. Okay, so kalau dalam kuantitatif macam saya kata tadi. Okay. Kuantitatif ni sebab kita punya prinsipal kita nak buat inference from the sample to the population. So that's why bila kita kata kita nak buat inference ni then kita kena pilih sample kita ni based on unbiased. Bila unbiased, teknik yang kita biasa gunakan adalah randomization. Random ni maksudnya everybody has similar opportunity to be involved or not to be involved in the study. So the opportunity is 50-50. Semua orang ada peluang yang sama untuk terlibat dalam kajian. Okay, ini maksud dia randomization. Random ni kita randomly pilih dan dia kena ada teknik. Okay, meanwhile, for qualitative, we purposely select information rich respondent. Uh, kalau dalam qualitative ni, we purposely pilih individu yang kita rasa mempunyai maklumat yang tepat mengenai apa yang kita nak kaji. Okay. Next one. Okay, so sampling in qualitative quantitative research. Okay, so bila kita nak buat sampling in qualitative quantitative research, benda yang pertama yang kita kena tahu adalah unit of analysis. Okay, so dalam unit of analysis ni, we need to know the sampling frame. Okay, sampling frame ni refers to the population from which the sample will be drawn and to which the sample data will be generalized. Uh, ini maksud sampling frame. Kita kena tahu the populasi, okay, uh, populasi yang kita nak to which the sample data will be generalized. Ini yang kita kena tahu. Sampling frame kita ni siapa? Okay, and then the unit of analysis is the major entity that you are analyzing in your study. So it is the analysis you do in your study that determines what the unit is. Okay, for example, if you are comparing the children into classroom on achievement test score, so the unit of analysis is the individual chart because you have a score for each chart. So you need uh, another example, if you are comparing the two classes on classroom climate, okay, so you need, uh, your unit of analysis is the group, in this case, the classroom. Uh, so unit of analysis ni then ikut Siapa nanti bila you all dah buat conclusion about your findings ni, your, your conclusion ni belongs to whom? Is it the group of people? Is it the organization? Or is it the individual employee? Ini maksud unit of analysis. Contohnya you all nak kaji tadi adalah uh, uh, apa tu job performance among secondary school teachers. Uh, so macam mana kita nak determine the unit of analysis nanti kita tengok. Dapatan kita nanti akan fokus kepada group of teachers or individual teachers. Okay. Faham eh unit of analysis ni? Okay. Next one sample. Okay so sample allows researcher to examine the characteristic of the population. So a sample can be de defined as a group of relatively smaller number of people selected from a population for investigation purpose. Sampel ni kita tahu lah eh, kita ambil beberapa beberapa individu ataupun kumpulan dalam populasi yang besar. Okay. Okay. Ini cara dia, the uh, apa tu the illustration on how we uh, select sample in uh, apa tu in quantitative research. So this uh, this is for example our study we want to know about this population. For example secondary school teacher. Okay. Then we conduct a, a okay. So the value that derived from the population, the name is parameter. Any value derived from the population, the name is parameter. Contohnya mean, ni mean. Okay, so kalau mu ni, 
Mu ni represent population. Tapi kalau sampel kita guna X bar. Okay, simbol dia eh. Okay, so daripada populasi ni, we randomly pick. Randomly pick, we pick sample. Uh, so ini sample. Okay, so the value that derived from sample, the name is statistic. Faham eh? Value derived from parameter, uh, sorry, value derived from uh, population, nama dia adalah parameter. The value derived from sample, nama dia adalah statistic. So statistik yang sebelum ni kita duk sebut-sebut tu sebenarnya derived value tu adalah kita ambil daripada sampel. Sebab itu nama dia statistik. Faham? Faham eh? Beza statistik dengan parameter. Parameter ni dia adalah any value that derived from sample uh, from population. Statistik adalah value yang kita derived from sample. Okay? Okay, semua dah pening dah. <laughs> okay, kita tengok dah pukul apa dah. Ni baru berapa slide ni. Okay, tak apa. Kita pukul 4, kita habis. 2 jam je. Nanti next week kita buat kelas lagi. Okay, eh. 2 jam je. Okay, so next one, sampling. Okay, so sampling is a process through which a sample is extracted from a population. Okay, so sampling ni merujuk, persampling ni merujuk kepada proses bagaimana kita extract sample daripada populasi. Okay, the more the sample is representative of the population, the higher is the accuracy of the inferences and better are the result generalizable. Generali generalizable. Okay, so semakin uh, apa tu sample ni, sample, kalau semakin sample ni represent the population ni, kita assume dia semakin tepat. Okay. Untuk mewakili populasi. A sample is said to be representative when the characteristic of elements selected are similar to that of entire target population. Kalau karakter, karakteristik sample kita ni semakin sama dengan populasi, okay, so kita kata dia representative. Okay, the results are Sorry, the results are said to be generalizable when the findings obtained from sample are equally true for the entire target population. Okay, and then sampling process may encounter the problem of systematic errors and sampling bias. Okay, so bila kita nak buat persampulan ni, sampling process ni akan ada error. Okay, error yang berlaku adalah dua jenis. Sampling error ataupun sampling bias. Ha. Dia ada error. Inilah nama error dalam persampulan. Bila kita nak buat persampulan tu, inilah error yang hmm, probably might happen. Okay, so systematic error can be defined as incorrect or false representation of the sample caused by over representation of one characteristic and or under representation of the others. Maksudnya kat sini sampel yang kita pilih ni sebenarnya tidak betul-betul mewakili populasi. Sebab contohnya eh, kita nak kaji level of proactive work behavior among secondary school teacher. Okey, tiba-tiba dalam kajian kita ni, dalam populasi kita ni eh, contoh Tiba-tiba dalam kajian kita, kita terpilih satu grup yang dominan. Dan grup dominan ni contoh dia, dia sangat reaktif. Kebetulan responden yang kita pilih ni sebenarnya reaktif grup. Dia bukan proaktif. Okay, so inilah dia, dia boleh jadi systematic error. Error yang berlaku bila kita tersalah pilih kumpulan yang mempunyai karakter dominan, karakteristik yang dominan in which this karakteristik dominan dia tidak represent the other group. Okay, so next one adalah sampling bias. It said to occur when the selected sample does not truly reflect the characteristic of population. Ha, so sampling bias inilah dua ni. Okay, so karakteristik uh, systematic error berlaku bila incorrect or false representation. Ha, dia lebih kurang sama ni. Systematic error dengan sampling bias. Okay. Next one. Key factors in sampling. So first, kita kena tahu bila kita nak buat persampulan, kita kena tahu sample size. Okay, next one. Kita kena tahu representativeness and parameter of the sample. And then next one, kita kena tahu access to the sample. Kita kena tahu sama ada kita ni ada access tak untuk kita uh, reach the sample. 
Next one, sampling strategy to be used. Uh, ini yang kita kena monitor betul-betul. Sample size, representativeness, access to the sample and sampling strategy to be used. Okay. And then foundation for sample size determination. Okay, bila kita nak determine sample size, dia ada beberapa kriteria yang kita kena tahu. Okay, the first one, error estimation. Okay, so Cochrane uh, 1997, 1977 formula use two key factors. Okay, yang dia ada pertama margin error dengan alpha level. Okay, margin error ni refer to the risk the researcher is willing to accept in the study or the error the researcher is willing to accept. Okay, and the next one alpha level which is the level of acceptable risk the researcher is willing to accept that the true margin of error exceed the acceptable margin of error. Okay, so for example, the probability that differences revealed by statistical analysis really do not exist or also known as type 1 error. Okay, and then the, another type of error which is type 2 error also known as beta error. Okay, so type 2 errors occur when statistical procedures result in a judgment or no, of no significant differences when these differences do indeed exist. Okay, next one. Okay, so acceptable margin error. Okay, so a general rule relative to acceptable margin of error in educational and social research is as follow. Kalau kita guna uh, categorical data, okay, we accept 5% margin of error is acceptable. Kalau kita guna categorical data according to Craigie and Morgan ni, Okay, 5% margin error ni is considered to be acceptable. But if we if we use the continuous data, we use 3% margin of error. Okay, so continuous ni, continuous and uh, categorical data ni, I do hope that you understand lah because we already discussed in detail last time. Okay, so for example eh, a 3% margin of error would result in the researcher being confident that the true mean of a 7 point scale is within plus minus 0.21, which is 0 0.3 times, 0 0.03 times uh, 7 point on the scale of the mean calculated from the research sample. Okay, for a dichotomous variable, a 5% margin of error would result in the researcher being confident that the proportion of respondents who were male as within plus minus 5% of the proportion calculated from the research sample. Okay, so researcher may increase these values when a higher margin of error is acceptable of, or may decrease these values when a higher degree of precision is needed. Okay, so bila kita, kita setkan uh, dia punya kriteria sama ada 5 ataupun 3, but still the researcher can increase or decrease the margin of error depend on their study. Okay, depend on the researcher. Okay, so next one is alpha level. Okay, so alpha level is used to determine sample size in most educational research studies. Okay, sama ada kita guna dua value, 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Okay, in Cochrane formula, the alpha level is incorporated into the formula by utilizing the T value for the alpha level selected. For example, T value for alpha 0 0.05 is 1.96 for sample size above 120. Okay, and then researchers should ensure they use the correct T value when their research involves smaller population. Okay, so for example, T value for alpha of 0 0.05 and a population of 60 is 2. Okay, T, T value 2. Eh? So in general, an alpha level of 0 0.05 is acceptable for most research. Okay, so an alpha level of 0.1 or lower may be used if the researcher is more interested in identifying marginal relationships, differences, or other statistical phenomena as a precursor to further studies. Okay, so biasanya eh, kalau dalam uh, kajian ed uh, educational research ni, eh, kita pakai, kita set alpha level kita dua sahaja, 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Okay, so kat sini biasa kalau dalam umum, Secara umumnya, point, uh, point 0.05 ni lebih lebih di-prefer lah. Okay, meanwhile uh, untuk point 0.1 ni kita pakai sekiranya uh, dalam kajian kita tu, it is a, it is a marginal relationship. Maksudnya kita tahu yang relationship tu marginal, kecil 
And then the differences or other statistical phenomena as a precursor to further study. Maksudnya kat sini kita set bawah ni sebab kita tahu mungkin kita perlukan another research in the future. Okay, so an alpha level of 0.1 0.01 may be used in those cases where decision based on the research are critical and errors may cause substantial financial or personal harm. Okay, so bila kita letak 0.1, uh, 0, uh, 0.01 ni dia lagi detail. 0.1 ni kalau kita tahu yang sebenarnya memang susah nak dapat uh, hubungan yang signifikan. So that's why kita reduce kan. You, you perasan eh, 0.1 ni lebih, lebih besar daripada 0.05. Okay, dia start dengan poin satu, poin satu kosong, dia jadi poin kosong lima dan last ni dia jadi poin kosong satu. Poin kosong satu ni dia paling precise lah. Poin kosong satu ni dia sama dengan 99%, 99.9% kita confident dengan finding kita. Sedangkan yang poin kosong lima ni dia sama dengan 99% Uh, sorry, 95.95% kita confident mengenai finding kita. Yang ni 90. Sorry, yang ni 99. Tak 90, 90. Okay. Kalau yang uh, point, point 10 ni maksudnya kita 90% kita confident dengan dapatan kajian kita. Kalau point 05 ni maksudnya kita 95% confident. Dia macam uh, apa tu? Uh, Vaksin lah macam vaksin. AstraZeneca ke. Okay, berapa persen yang kita confident dengan keberkesanan that vaksin. Sama juga dengan bila kita set alpha level ni. Set alpha level ni dia menentukan sebanyak mana, sejauh mana kita confident dengan dapatan kita ni adalah dapatan yang betul. Okay, so it relies on how, what level of alpha that we set. Okay, that one clear eh? Okay, so next one, saya, saya tengok kat mana yang saya boleh, saya boleh stop lagi ni. Kita stop dekat types of, uh, types of error nanti. Okay, so next one is variance estimation. According to Cochrane 1977, he listed four ways of estimating population variance for sample size determination. Okay, so dia kata ada empat benda. Okay, so yang pertama, take the sample into step and use the results of the first step to determine how many additional responses are needed to attain an appropriate sample sample size based on the variance observed in the first step data. Ini uh, kalau Cochrane ni macam mana kita nak tentukan sample size dia kata ada empat step ni. Yang pertama sekali dia kata kita gunakan uh, the result of the first step to determine how many additional responses are needed to attain an appropriate sample size based on the variance observed in the first step data. Okay, and the second one, use the file, uh, use the pilot study results. The third one, use data from previous studies of the same, of the same, uh, of the same or a similar population or estimate or guess the structure of the population assisted by some logical mathematical result. Okay. And, okay, so the first three ways are logical and produce valid estimates of variance. Therefore, we do. Therefore, uh, they do not need to be discussed further. Kalau ikut cadangan daripada Okra ni, yang tiga ni dia applicable. Okay, cuma yang hujung ni. Okay, in many educational and social research studies, it is not feasible to use any of the first three ways, and the researcher must estimate variance using the fourth method. Okay, and a researcher typically needs to estimate the variance of scale and categorical variables. Okay, and then to estimate the, vari uh, the variance of a scale variable, one must determine the inclusive range of the scale and then divide by the number of standard deviation that would include all possible values in the range and then square this number. Okay, next one. Okay, so for example, if a researcher use a seven-point scale and given that six standard division, three to each side of the mean, would capture 98% of all responses. So the calculation would be as follow. Okay, so kalau kita guna tiga, uh, seven, tujuh, eh, tujuh like, uh, tujuh point uh, like, like scale, okay, 
Ini cara pengiraan. Macam mana kita nak kira variance tadi. Tujuh, number of points in the scale divided by six, which is number of standard deviation. Okay, so when estimating the variance of a dichotomous or proportional variance such as gender, Craigie and Morgan 1970 recommend that the researchers should use 0.5. Okay, as an estimate of the population. Okay, and then this proportion will result in the maximization of variance which will also produce the maximum sample size. Okay, this proportion can be used to estimate variance in the population. For example, squaring 0.5 Okay, squaring 0.5 ni will result in a population variance estimate of 0.25 for a dichotomous variable. Okay, so ini pula types of error. Okay, so bila, bila saya sebut types of error ni, we, uh, we need to know there are few types of error exist uh, when we want to determine our result. Okay, so how to determine the errors ni? The first one, it is based on kita punya hypothesis and decision yet that we make. Okay, again, what is hypothesis, guys? What is hypothesis? Early assumption. Early assumption. Okay, so how we develop the hypothesis? Uh, develop hypothesis with three. Observation. Uh, lagi, lagi. Next answer, Deva. What else? How do how we develop hypothesis? First, based on assumption. Uh, sorry, based on observation. Yes, correct. Next one. Based on the notes with literature review. First, observation. Maksudnya, we observe we observe the phenomena and then we know the logic of the uh, apa tu uh, why of why certain phenomena happen. The second one, we confirm it through literature review. Okay, so we determine, we develop the hypothesis from the observation as well as literature review. Okay, so for example, eh, when we when we mention our null hypothesis, okay, okay, and then uh, uh, our hypo, uh, then we reject. Sorry, then uh, sorry, if our hypothesis, if our null hypothesis is false, then we reject. Is it correct or wrong decision? When we state our uh, null hypothesis and then after we conduct our study, we found that our hypothesis, our null hypothesis is false. Then we reject null hypothesis. Is the decision is correct or wrong? Correct. 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 Okay. So we, we did a correct decision. Next one. Okay. We propose a, 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 a null hypothesis and then after we conduct the null, uh, we conduct the research, we figure out that our hypothesis is, our null hypothesis is true. But we fail to reject null hypothesis. Is it correct decision or wrong decision? Huh. Correct. Lagi sekali saya ulang. <laughs> okay. We develop one null hypothesis and then we conduct a study. Okay, after we conduct the study, we, uh, the hypothesis should be true, but we fail to reject. Is it correct decision or wrong decision? A wrong decision. It is correct. It is true, but we fail to reject. Wrong or correct? Saja nak menagak. We fail to reject. That means we yeah. accept. True. Yes. Correct decision. Alah, hai kadis. Saya saja je. Terus tukar. Eh. I'm <laughs> correct too. Eh, hey, Amir yang cakap tadi. Saya tak. Alah. Oh, salah. Salah orang. Okay. Baru saya menagak sikit. Terus dah tukar jawap, uh, jawapan. Okay. So, next one. Okay. We, we develop one null hypothesis and then it is true. But we reject the null hypothesis. Is it the right decision or the wrong decision? Wrong decision. Because null, if null is true, we need to accept. Yes. So this one, the name is <laughs> one error. Okay, the type 1 error happened when we reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true. It is true, but we reject. 
Okay? The name is type 1 error. Faham eh? Type 1 okay. error happen because we reject the null hypothesis when it is actually true. Okay, maksudnya kita buat keputusan yang salah lah. Okay, so next one. Okay, we, we, we develop a, a, a null hypothesis and then we conduct the study and then after that we found out that the null hypothesis is false. It is wrong. But we fail to reject. Fail to reject means that we accept. Is it a wrong or correct decision? We fail to reject. We fail to reject. It is wrong, but we fail to reject. Hmm. Wrong decision. Wrong decision. So the name is. Hey. <laughs> okay. So faham eh? Bezer type 1 and type 2 error. Type 1, it happened when we reject the null hypothesis when it is at the first place is correct. Okay. Meanwhile, the type 2 error happened when we fail to reject the null hypothesis when it is at the first place is false. Dia salah tapi kita tak boleh nak tolak. Itu type 2 error. Type 1 error pula dia betul tapi kita tak terima. Tak boleh nak terima. Okay. Faham eh? Basic type 1 and type 2 error. Okay. So next one Doctor, is... Doctor, yeah. I have one question. Uh, tadi doctor kata uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, hypothesis is uh, observation review. Uh, In review. Uh, Tapi uh, ada lagi satu doktor, uh, teori describe in the study. Is it same with the literature review? Lit yes. Oh. Okay, so in okay. literature review, we either review past study and we also review theories. Dua benda. Okay, theories. Uh, okay. Uh. Study. okay, so now, now, okay, before you, you are able to... Uh, uh, be, uh, you are able to distribute your questionnaire. The question now arise is how many numbers that we need in our study. Kalau let's say tadi kita kata kita nak guna sample. Kan daripada populasi tadi, daripada 3.5 juta guru tadi, okay, kita tak mampu nak collect semua. Okay, tapi sekarang kita nak kena tentukan berapa yang kita perlukan. Berapa, how many sample that we need in our study Okay, to make sure that our study is representative to the population. Okay, so now we need to determine the sample size. Okay, so in general, there is no clear-cut answer as to what constitutes an adequate or sufficient size for a sample. Tak ada. And there is no cut, cut off point. Tak ada satu pun yang uh, one fixed, one fit all. Tak ada. Okay. There are banyak consideration. Okay, so continuous data requires smaller sample size compared to categorical data. Ini general rule given by Bartlett, Koplik and Higgin. Dia kata continuous data diperlukan sample yang lebih kecil berbanding categorical data. Okay, and then another consideration given given by Frankel and Klik, dia kata a recommended minimum number of subject is 100 for descriptive study. Ni study ni dia, uh, dia related to design eh. Kalau you all conduct a descriptive uh, quantitative research design, so you you all perlukan minimum 100. Okay, kalau you all buat correlational research design, correlational research study, you all perlukan 50 minimum. Kalau you all buat experimental and causal comparative study, you all perlukan 30. Ha, ini general guideline given by Frankel and Click. Okay, faham eh? Faham? Okay, dia banyak cara. Dia tak ada satu cara yang betul-betul, yang ni je kena betul, tak ada. It depends pada researcher, mana yang dia nak guna. Okay, so next one. Okay. Next one based on Cochrane sample size formula. Okay, so this is the formula given by Cochrane. Okay, dia kata the sample size formula for continuous data equals to n naught equals to t square times s square divided by d square, where t equals to value for selected alpha level of 0 0.25 in each tail, 
Okay, tail ni, kena you all ingat lah eh, sekor dua ekor ni. Ni. Okay, kalau you all letak alpha 2.05, so each tail ni dia akan jadi 0.025, yang sebelah ni pun akan jadi 0.025. Kalau dua ekor. Dua ekor ni maksudnya, your hypothesis is non-directional. Okay. Ha, inilah masa untuk menghubungkan balik sel-sel otak yang dah belajar daripada awal semester hari tu. Two tail, one tail. Okay. Okay and then S equals to estimate of standard deviation. This one referring to standard deviation in the population. So which is the value is 1.167. So the value dia fixed 1.167. Okay so estimate of variance deviation for seven point scale calculated by using seven inclusive range of scale divided by six number of standard deviations that include almost all uh, approximately is 98% of the possible values in the range. So ni kita letak 1.167. D referring to acceptable margin of error for mean being estimated. For example 0.21. Okay. So except, uh, so dalam kes ni number of point on uh, primary scale times acceptable margin of error. Okay, or point on primary scale, so seven. So acceptable of margin of error, point zero three. Researcher is willing to accept. So tujuh darab dengan point kosong tiga. So dapatlah point dua satu. Okay, next one. So kita assume that a researcher has set alpha point zero five. Okay, and then plans to use a seven point scale. Okay, maksudnya dalam kajian dia nanti untuk uh, pilihan answer tu dia nak pakai tujuh instead of five. Dia nak pakai tujuh. Okay, faham eh? So now dia letak alpha 0.05, error dia letak 3%. Ingat tadi eh, kalau untuk continuous data, Craig and Morgan suggest margin error equals to 3%. Okay, and then standard deviation equals to 1.167. So we just plug in the value into the equation. Okay. So T square, T ni equals to 1.96 square. Okay, this one. Kalau kita pakai 0.5 ni, automatically dia adalah 1.96. Kat sini. Okay, so kita masuk je. 1.96 square times 1.167 square divided by 7 times 0 0.03 bracket square. Okay, we just plug in into the equation, then we get the 118 as our sample. Okay, so for example, eh, if the population, if the population of our study is 1,679, so the required sample size is 118. Ini yang kita perlukan daripada sample ni, daripada populasi. Faham? Faham tak? Pengiraan ni? Faham. Saya tu faham. Okay. Next one. Okay. However, since the sample is exit. Saya rasa ni. Okay. Dah tengok ni. However, since the sample size exit 5% of the population. Okay. Cochrane 1977, correction formula should be used to calculate the final sample. Okay, so Cochrane ni dia set pula kriteria lain. Dia kata kalaulah sample size based on pengiraan earlier ni, okay, exceed 5%. Exceed 5% daripada yang uh, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole population, dia kena ada corrective formula pula yang kita kena follow. Okay, cuba kira berapa 5% kalau daripada 1,679? Mana tu lah kalkulator saya? Ha, inilah. Okay, so kalau 5% daripada 1,679 ni dia equals to 84, betul? Betul? 84 kan? Betul. Okay, so tadi yang kita dapat adalah 118. So, 180 ni exceed 84. So, if if the answer ni exceed the 5%, so we need to use another formula, another corrective formula. Okay, so the formula is n equals to n naught divided by 1 plus n naught divided by population. So we just plug in the value 118 divided by 
1 plus 118 divided by 1,679. So the answer is N equals to 111. Okay. So this is the final, not yet the final. This is the estimated sample size that we need for our study. Uh, after we use the uh, Cochrane correction formula. Clear? Eh? Okay. Okay, so this procedure results in the minimum return sample. So value dia kat sini ni, value yang dia bagi ni sebenarnya adalah minimum. Minimum sample size that we need before we start to analyze our data. Okay, ini yang kita kena ada dalam tangan sebelum kita start buat data analysis. Faham eh? Okay, so maksudnya kita perlukan satu number lain yang kita perlu distribute supaya hujungnya kita dapat 111. Hujungnya kita nak 111. Wajib ada, this is compulsory untuk kita ada 111 before we run the analysis. But now, the issue is how many that we need to distribute so that at the end of the day kita dapat 111. Kenapa dia boleh jadi, dia boleh, kenapa kita kena consider value lain? Why do we need to consider another value? Why not we just consider, uh, distribute 111? Why? Why? Because during the data collection procedure, if we distribute exactly 111, there might be the possibility that our respondent cannot be contacted. They do not answer our questionnaire. They misplace our questionnaire. They wrongly answer the questionnaire. Ha, apa lagi? Ha, so ada probability yang kita bila kita let's say kita distribute 111 ni Kita mungkin tak akan dapat balik keseluruhan 111 ni That's why kita kena make sure that kita tambahkan sikit Number dia sebelum kita buat data collection Supaya hujungnya kita dapat 111 Faham? Okay if a researcher has a captive audience, this sample size may be attained easily. However, since many educational and social research studies often use data collection methods such as survey and other voluntary participation methods, so the response rates are typically well below 100%. Kalau kita distribute 111 dan kita dapat 111, this is very good. Tapi berapa kes je yang kita distribute 111 dan kita dapat 111? How many cases? Right? Ha, so maksudnya kat sini kita kena buat adjustment according to the response rate ni. Okay, so Salkin 1997 recommended oversampling when he stated that if you are mailing out surveys or questionnaire, count on increasing your sample size by 40% or 50% to account for lost mail and uncooperative subject. Uh, ini cadangan daripada Sakin. Bila kita nak buat uh, 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 research ni, kita make sure kita nak kena oversampling. Daripada 111 ni, kita kena increasekan supaya kita dapat capture ataupun dapat uh, settle the issue of uh, miss, uh, sorry, uh, loss of questionnaire ni. Missing questionnaire. Okay, so dia cadangkan kita increasekan 40 ataupun 60% daripada 111 ni. Ini cadangan dia. Okay, meanwhile, Fink 1995 stated that oversampling can add cost to the, to the survey but it is often necessary. Walaupun dia costly tapi dia perlu. Kita perlu. Okay, and then Cochrane 1977 stated that a good, a second consequence, consequence is of course that the variance of estimates are increased because the sample actually obtained is smaller than the target sample. Okay, so the factor can be allowed for at least approximately in selecting the size of the sample. However, many researchers criticize the use of oversampling to ensure that this minimum sample size is achieved and suggestion on how to secure the minimum sample size are scarce. Okay, walaupun ada debate, tapi it is necessary untuk kita tambahkan sample size ni. 
Okay. Next one. Okay, so if the researcher decide to use oversampling, four methods may be used to determine the anticipated response rate. So berapa? Sekarang ni the issue is berapa yang kita nak kena increase. Okay, berapa kan? Daripada 111 tadi, berapa kita nak increase? Okay, so uh, ikutkan cadangan ni. Okay, dia ada empat cadangan kat sini. Okay. First, we take the sample in two steps and use the result of the first step to estimate how many additional responses may be expected from the second step. Ini kalau ikut cadangan pertama ni, maksud dia daripada 111 tadi, kita conduct dulu study, kita buat dulu satu kajian yang gunakan 111 ni dan kita tengok end result dia dapat berapa. Contohnya kalau kita dapat, uh, kat sini kita dapat 90. Okay, kita conduct 111 dan kita dapat 90. So 90 daripada 111 berapa persen respond rate dia? 81 persen, betul? Kan? 81 persen respond rate kan? 90 bahagi 111 darab 100. So 81 kan? Betul? Deva je saya nampak dia. Deva tengah kira ke? Ha, ha. Ke se, uh, tadi kalau tu macam mana? 90 bahagi dengan 111. Yes. Ha. 81. Ha. So respond rate dia adalah 81. So maksudnya kita kena buat kajian kedua. Bila dalam kajian kedua ni, kita kena increasekan sebanyak 80 uh, sebanyak uh, 19%. Ah. Equal to 137 Ini yang kita kena distribute 111 divide by 0.81 Equal to 137 right? Ah, so hmm. ini yang kita kena distribute untuk yang actual study so that kita akan dapat 111. Faham untuk suggestion pertama ni? Maksudnya kalau ikut suggestion pertama ni, kita kena buat dua dua kajian yang gunakan sample size yang sama. First kita buat guna yang 111 ni dan kita tengok berapa yang kita dapat. 90 contohnya. So bagi contoh 90. So dan kita dapatkan berapa respond rate dia. So based on this respond rate, kita buat recalculation dan kita increase kat sini. Ini adalah actual kajian kita. Kita kena distribute 137 so that end result kita dapat 111. Faham? Untuk yang first cadangan ni. Faham tak? Faham? Faham, faham betul. Okay, so next one, use pilot study result. Okay, cadangan kedua dia kata kita guna pilot study. Contohnya dalam kajian pilot kita, kita guna 30. 30 sampel. Kita collect data daripada 30. Dan lepas distribute, contohnya kita dapat 20. Daripada 30 kita distribute ni, kita dapat 20. So 20 bahagi 30 darab 100 dapat berapa respon rate? 66. 66.67, right? Yes. Hmm. So yang hujung ni maksudnya 111 divide by 0.6667 Equals to See what? Uh, 166 Right? Nampak ni 111 divide by 0.6667 Equals to 166.5 Right? Betul Doktor Approaching what, Sebab 166.5 ni mana ada respondent uh, Mana ada manusia 0.05 kan? So kita jadikan dia hmm. 167 Ha, so ini kalau untuk approach kedua ni, ha, ini pengiraan dia. Okay, so ni 167 contohnya. Faham? Macam mana nak kira based on pilot study? Faham. Okay, so next one adalah use response rate from previous studies of the same or a similar population. So kalau ikut recommendation yang ketiga, contohnya kajian kita sekarang kita nak buat among secondary school teacher. 
okay, among secondary school teachers. So apa yang kita boleh buat adalah kita refer previous studies that also use uh, uh, secondary school teachers then we check on their response rate. Kalau response rate yang dijantikan oleh previous study adalah point contohnya point 93, 93% sorry 93% so then kita just divide 111 divide by 0.93 so kita akan dapat 119 119 right? Ah, so ini yang kita akan distribute okay and then lastly based on estimate the response rate hmm. ini ini susah sikit lah yang nombor 4 ni Okay, so the first uh, the first three ways are logical and will produce valid estimates of response rate. Therefore, they do not need to be discussed. Ah, ni sama macam yang saya cakap tadi lah. Yang nombor empat ni kita tak payah pakai. Ha. Walaupun dia letak sebab dia susah sikit yang nombor empat ni. So, bila you all nak menentukan sample size nanti, inilah consideration yang you all boleh pakai. Bila nak, nak increase kan daripada yang minimum tadi kepada berapa yang kita perlu increase supaya end of the day kita dapat 111. Faham? Faham eh? Okay, so for example eh, for example, it was anticipated that a response rate of 65% would be achieved based on prior research experience given a required minimum sample size corrected yang kita kira tadi adalah 111. So the following calculation were used to determine the, uh, the drawn sample size required to produce the minimum sample size. Okay, so ini yang kita kira tadi. Uh, ni yang, ya, sama je lah eh, yang pengiraan tadi. Kalau let's say kita dapat 65%, so then this is how we can calculate. 111 divided by 0.65, so kita dapat 171. Exactly sama macam yang saya tunjukkan tadi, yang ketiga-tiga contoh ni. Okay? Clear eh? Okay, saya rasa saya stop kat sini lah hari ni kot. Saya stop dekat uh, calculation yang ni dulu. So any question so far? Ada soalan? Pasal sample size. Dah saturated lah Doktor. Ah, dah tahu dah. Hak tu semua diam. Hak ni tapi hak ni dia hak ni dia practical. So you all kena betul-betul saya -betul. margin error tadi. So you all baca dan faham. Tapi yang penting macam mana nak menentukan sample size ni. Okay this is very critical. Okay sebab nanti uh, takut bila you all buat FYP nanti tak supervisor tak boleh nak entertain selalu. Saya pun memang tak boleh nak entertain selalu eh. <laughs> So you all kena memang betul-betul faham. Okey tak apa nanti baca dulu lecture note nanti next week kita akan ada kelas lagi. Okey kita buat dua jam. Okey so thank you guys for today. Uh, so take care. Uh, ya. Yeah. Doktor nak tanya tentang assignment ya uh, nak tanya tentang instrumental boleh? Boleh, boleh boleh. Nak tanya apa? Ha tadi doktor ada list down uh, many items for instrumental daripada artikel tak sampai 18 some of the article macam saya punya turn stuff turn over that uh, dia punya instrument item instrument tak banyak dalam lima is it okay or saya kena uh, okay okay so oh, tak perlu tajak cari banyak lah yang ada okay. banyak five is acceptable very good question dia bang sebab sekarang ni saya lupa nak remind okay dia biasanya ada beberapa guideline lah eh when we want to prepare uh, when we want to select the instrument the first it is based on factor loading tadi or based on the reliability the reliability value factor loading and so on another consideration is the number of items so basically uh, the, the number of items measuring each construct shouldn't be less than three shouldn't be less than three Uh, so the range may be 3 yang cantik lah eh, 3 to 10, 3 to 8, itu cantik. But sometimes uh, untuk level you all try to avoid sama ada items yang terlalu sikit bawah daripada 3 ataupun items that is too many. Too many ni dia boleh jadi mengukur satu driver you all ada lebih kurang 30, 25, 40 items. Ini terlalu banyak. Kalau boleh cari instrumen yang ada dalam range 3, 10 ataupun 20. 20 tu acceptable lagi lah. Tapi jangan terlalu banyak untuk mengukur satu-satu variable. Jangan terlalu banyak. You just imagine siapa yang nak jawab nanti. Okay. Uh, kita pun dah malas so apatah lagi orang lain. Uh, cuba minimalkan. Okay. 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 Tapi you all tak boleh simply kalau let's say the authors recommend you to use 40 tapi tiba-tiba you all pandai-pandai ubah 20. Tak boleh. It is wrong. Okay. 
Kita kalau hmm, kita okay, ingat okay. instrumen yang kita kena ambil keseluruhan kecuali kecuali the recommended uh, items are 40 but after you go through the uh, factor loading or chroma alpha value the value is lesser than 0.7 or 0.5 so you may consider to delete kalau dia terlalu banyak you just pick those items that has large uh, has a large chroma alpha 0.7 and above ah itu boleh okay 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 is there any question any more question before we stop for today sebab saya sudah cukup lah hari ni dah dua jam setengah cukup Okay, if there is no more questions, so we stop here. Thank you so much for today. I will try to upload soon as possible today's lecture. Okay, so take care guys. Assalamualaikum. Okay, doctor. Thank you so much.